Right now we're sitting at about three quarters of the way through 2021 and we're still squarely dealing with the effects of COVID-19. Air and the droplets carried within it are the primary medium through which this disease is conducted and indoors is where we're most susceptible. This makes buildings a key player in staging the most problematic kinds of interactions. This also makes buildings and architects a powerful ally in fighting and controlling the spread of the disease. Air is largely an invisible substance, and some architects believe that their job is akin to making air and its flow visible. Under this line of thought, buildings might be just big containers of air, and architects' role is to draw and shape this elusive substance with building materials. On one end of this spectrum, architects like Philippe Rahm conceive of structures that are almost completely defined by pockets of air alone. Drawing this kind of architectural design intent is a particular challenge. Most drawing conventions develop to show the solid stuff of buildings, the stuff that we see with our eyes, rather than focusing on the stuff between the stuff felt with our skin. So Rahm's design drawings don't look like traditional blueprints. Instead, they are beautiful gradients of pinks and blues, greens and reds, and they all try to communicate visually concepts which aren't themselves visual. Air temperature, humidity, flow, architects invent special ways to draw these important aspects of buildings. Related to COVID, one architecture firm, Louis Sermaki Lewis, put together a manual of physical distancing to help explain and visualize the information coming out of the CDC. They felt that as architects, they could help the cause by visually explaining the abstract medical recommendations and findings in spatial terms. The over 200 page report provides visual graphics to the challenges of living in the time of COVID-19. Also included are ranges of risk that are mapped against institutional recommendations. They also include how air moves and flows during different activities like cycling, and they include technical architectural aspects of how the HVAC systems work in our buildings. And all this got me thinking of other times that air in our buildings was considered dangerous. I wanted to take a look at how architects reacted over the years with design practices that helped to manage these conditions. Good ventilation practices and codes have developed over hundreds of years to try and keep us safe from the buildup of unwanted airborne accumulations. Of course, in the beginning, things that we don't necessarily think of as dangerous or difficult to expel today, they had to be designed, and something as simple as excess heat had to be studied and figured out. For instance, ancient Minoans, a civilization that lived in the island of Crete around 3500 BC, incorporated sophisticated designs for passive cooling with wind towers that produce and take advantage of the stack effect to enable greater ventilation than what was possible with simple openings alone. The stack effect is when warm air is able to rise up and out of a building, which in turn brings cooler air in through the openings below. Other forms of ventilation through roofs and otherwise have since been important features to exhaust heat or smoke from fires used in cooking and heating. At an urban scale, this finally needed mandating in England by 1631, when King Charles I decreed that the ceilings in houses must be 10 feet or higher, and that windows must be higher than their width to allow for natural ventilation. In 1666, a great fire in London destroyed a number of old housing stock, and many were built in their place which adhered to this standard and included chimneys, fireplaces, and large windows. This was undermined, however, when in the 1700s, property tax levels were determined by homes, window, and chimney count, and frugal citizens began boarding them all up, many of which remain boxed in even today. By the 1880s, the amount of airflow suggested inside of buildings was given a quantitative value, and the general consensus was that the proper ventilation required was 30 CFM per person. CFM stands for cubic feet per minute. This is how many cubes with one foot sides of air volume need to be replaced within a room inside of 60 seconds. In the US, 22 states had this value prescribed by law in 1925. This is actually a pretty high amount of airflow. It could make some people uncomfortable by being overly drafty. Now the typical rate is quite a bit lower, as low as 10 CFM in spaces with their minimal activity. In the United States, ventilation standards evolved in dense urban areas like New York first. This is not only because the density and the need to regulate how buildings serve citizens within these close quarters, but also the dangerous conditions of the city air and unscrupulous developers that wanted to cut costs in any way possible. By the mid-1890s, designers and architects in New York needed to file their building plans with the Bureau of Light and Ventilation. 
For instance, the 21-story American Surety Building in New York, built in 1896, it included a ventilation system, but only for the lower seven floors. Workers on these levels couldn't open their windows because the dirt and the grime of the city streets would get in. Shortly after the turn of the century, architects of the modern movement were actively promoting an architecture that would make us healthier and safer just through building. One great example is Elvar Elto's sanatorium, built in 1932 in Finland. The building was a hospital dedicated to the patients with tuberculosis. And tuberculosis is a disease caused by the inhalation of certain kind of bacteria that attacks the lungs. At the time, the cure for tuberculosis was for the patient to rest inside of an environment with clean air and sunshine. So Alto considered the building as a medical instrument to enable easy access to these activities. In addition to its clinical layout and clean material palette, each floor included sunning balconies near the bedrooms, and healthier patients could go and lie on the sun deck on the very top floor of the building. After World War II, nothing seemed more dangerous to us and the air than nuclear weapons, and architects like Ludwig Hilbersheimer were deeply frightened by their power. He studied regional scale implications of the impact of nuclear bombs by looking at ideal spacings for cities to minimize the destructions and the harm. Part of that included looking at prevailing winds and how harmful radioactive fallout could be carried in the air from one city to the next. But then continuing on into the 1960s, there was a real interrogation of air and airflow as important aspects of architectural design. On the opposite spectrum of scale than Hilbersheimer's, the firm Archigram was looking at individual solutions for air control, like their projects called the Cushicol or the Sudaloon. Each of these were mobile structures in two parts. It had a chassis and an inflatable envelope or a bubble. You could ride around in them, and they had an internal environmental system and controls, in addition to technology that could connect you with others around you. They had plugs like a door, and you could connect them together to make larger constructions with friends, to create collective environments with those that you deemed safe. This kind of thinking prompted the theorist and historian Rainer Banham to write a comprehensive history of environmental systems for buildings that he called the architecture of the well-tempered environment. In the book, he traces how buildings of the past were massive and thick, but well-ventilated structures. And these gave way over time, through technological solutions, to thin and sealed off buildings. Their thinness doesn't allow for the materials to absorb the sun energy in the same way and release it when it's cool. Also, by sealing off the buildings, we just move the same air around again and again. While we have the technology to solve these problems that come with these changes, there are new unforeseen problems that emerge. And one of those might be Legionnaire's disease, a severe form of pneumonia. It was discovered and acquired its name in 1976, when 182 people got sick, all of whom attended a convention at the American Legion at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia. The cause was determined to be a new strain of bacteria that they named Legionella after the incident. It is believed that the bacteria grew within the cooling towers of the air conditioning system in the building, and then spread throughout the space throughout the ducting. But back to people like Arca Graham and Rainer Banham, people like Richard Rogers sought to feature the HVAC system as an exposed, visible architectural component in projects like the Pompidou Center in Paris. It's lined with multicolored pipes and ducts which encircle the building in a three-dimensional wall. Not only does this make them and the building flexible, it celebrated the technology that pushes the air throughout our buildings, elevating the simple functional tools into a spectacular and understandable monument of technology. Today, not everyone has learned the lessons though, and problems like sick building syndrome, or SBS for short, plague office buildings across the world. This is when occupants experience symptoms related to the time spent indoors without any other specific illness. A 1984 World Health Organization committee report suggested that up to 30% of new and remodeled buildings worldwide may be subject to excessive complaints related to indoor air quality. SBS is marked by headache and irritation of the eyes, nose, or throat. It might lead to a dry cough, dry or itchy skin, dizziness and nausea, difficulty in concentrating, fatigue and sensitivity to odors. Most of the complaints, though, report relief soon after leaving a building. One of the primary causes of sick building syndrome is inadequate ventilation. 
And this can lead to the building up of chemical contaminants from indoor sources like adhesive, carpeting, upholstery, manufactured wood products, copy machines, pesticides, and cleaning agents, which may emit volatile organic compounds or VOCs, including formaldehyde. It might also include biological indoor contaminants like bacteria, molds, pollen, and viruses. These contaminants may breed in stagnant water that has accumulated inside of the ducts of the building or the humidifiers and the drain pans, or where the water is collected inside of the ceiling tiles or in the carpeting or in the insulation in the walls. We don't necessarily know what a post-pandemic architecture will be yet. Of course, many were working on it, but I wanted to leave with a project that is all about revealing the amount of space and technology that goes into controlling the flow of air in a typical office building. As part of the 2014 Venice Biennale exhibition, they constructed a section from a typical office setup within an old building in the exhibition hall. The drop ceiling sits about 10 feet off the floor, while at least another 10 feet above that drop ceiling is given over almost entirely to the ducting. While there are other pipes and other things in there, the size of that space is often dictated by the ducts because their size is large and it's determined by the amount of airflow that's necessary. So half of the building is completely inaccessible, and it's explicitly about making the other half fully accessible. And I think that this gives us some perspective on just how much of architecture is dedicated to solving the problem of moving air. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. You might also appreciate other videos dealing with the four fundamentals of water, wind, earth, and fire. Videos come out every week, and a subscription will help to ensure that you see each one. See you soon.